Robin is here from Los Angeles, and I have had the great pleasure of knowing Robin for a really long time now, since the mid-90s. I've been an enormous fan of her work and followed it closely since the beginning, and it's been a real joy for us to work with her. She has shown in the Whitney Biennial She's had many prestigious one-person exhibitions um, for an artist her age. She's worked at, had a one-person show at the Des Moines Art Center. She's had a one-person show at the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston. She has shown all over the country and internationally. And she's shown in Berlin and Paris and all over Europe. And it is just a thrill to work with her. I adore it. So Robin, thank you for coming from Los Angeles. Thank you for this fabulous show and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Tally, and thank you to all of you guys. Yay! <laughs> That's for you. <laughs> thank you guys, I couldn't be more grateful to see such a big crowd. And even though I love talking in public, this is harder for me to do in front of all this new work. Um, so I'm gonna start with why that would be, because a, a few of you know my work from the past, and this is a pretty drastic change, and this is really the first time I've shown it. Um, I worked for, well, however long, it's about 13 or 14 years just with a little mechanical pencil until the work that was made in this show, which started in spits and, you know, just kind of in weird starts for, a for the last two years. But finally, in the last, I'd say in the last year, I started to get my grounding using color again. I tried oil painting, I tried acrylics, I tried watercolor, and I made a lot of terrible work. I mean, tons of terrible work. Hopefully you're not thinking to yourself, yeah, some of it's on the walls right now. <laughs> but, and that is fine if you think so. But trust me, the stuff that's not here is way worse. And um, I just wanna tell you why I would make this big change, because I have, I've had a pretty good run at making it and I liked making work with a little mechanical pencil and it was very obsessive and it kept me it kept me in my safe little world of my studio and it kept me kind of protected from anything that made me uncomfortable the work was about how anxious I felt about the world it was about my attitudes about being in groups of people and being uncomfortable with that and I have slowly had to face uh, kind of some real life situations, which meant I couldn't keep hiding out. I kind of like people anyway, even though I hid away from them. And as I started to change my life, I also started to realize I needed my work to change. I tried again and again, to be honest with you. Artists all know how this is. We always want to make big changes, but you get really scared. You like your safety zone. I liked mine for a little too long. And then, um, well, I guess I'll just tell you guys what happened briefly without dwelling on it. I lost a lot of work in Hurricane Sandy. And I could go into details for a long, long time about how hard that was. One of the pieces took two years to make and was really, really obsessive and had around 50,000 little human beings on it that took, you know, it took me out of really, there was times when I didn't leave my house for something like two weeks. And um, I, did, I just worked to the point of madness, really. And um, then a year later, when that, when that piece and many others were kind of swept away in a hurricane wave, um, that was hard, although sort of prophetic, because I had made a whole series of narrative drawings based on the world ending with a hurricane wave. So there was a moment right when I heard the news, I kind of had to say, I kind of had to smile almost and go, wow, I, can't, I don't know that I deserved it. I don't know what I thought, but I felt like I almost made it happen. Um, and it wasn't as hard for me as I thought it would be. I had some time when it was, and then I had to face like, the inevitable question that we artists face all the time anyway, why the hell do I do this? Why do I put myself through such torture um, and, and then just see things go away. It's just material. Everything on this wall right now is just material, really, when you break it down. So I had to kind of question again and again and really make lists in my head to remind myself of why I do this. And it came down to just being something so basic and so simple, which is that I was just a kid who really just wanted to make drawings all the time. Um, I liked staying inside. That was a part of it. I liked being indoors, and I like kind of uh, just showing how I feel the world is to be in 2D images. And that simplicity of my goal and my drive in life uh, 
was just really powerful to me in a time when I needed something so basic. And so I just kind of, I just tried really hard to think of how I could pare my imagery down even to what that felt like. And it came down to just really emotive type, um, well, just, just kind of really mysterious and emotive imagery of landscapes. And um, the American landscape has made its way into this work. And I didn't really think about artists as much when I was making my previous work. It was all very um, kind of from a manic brain and not appreciative of my fellow artists that I love. And this work is a, a little, has a little bit more of a nod to the bigger world, both in a human way and uh, it embraces my artists that I love. There's a, I could go on and on about the artists that kind of influence this, but I'll maybe wait and see if you guys see any of them or if you want to talk about any of them. Um, but I got rid of human life. There's no figures in this work. That was a big deal, too, because I was pretty insistent on that. Um, I thought I would be making that work until I died, basically, and I can only tell you, the fact that I'm not making that work anymore feels better than anything I've ever done in my whole art career. And I'm more behind these than I've ever been behind anything else. It feels like it's from a, just such a different place. I also am making work that's just coming from kind of an impulse. And I also got to feel like I did when I was in undergraduate school out in East Texas when I was first learning to construct images and understand what a picture plane was and how different a horizon line up here looks from down here and what that does to the human brain when they're looking at landscape. So those are the things that just became kind of dull in the way I was working before. And then suddenly I was challenging myself to restructure the way I thought about all of this. Um, I'm not sure how much else I have to say, but hopefully you guys have questions. Um, because that would make this easier on me. It is admittedly harder for me to talk about this work, like I said, than, than it's ever been for me to talk about anything. I don't really know all the reasons. I could probably guess a few, but yes? Which artists? Marsden Hartley? Or? Yeah, Arthur Dove, Marsden Hartley. Van Gogh is even a part of this world to me. Georgia O'Keeffe is. Um, who else? Those are a lot of the, those are the ones that have been on my mind a lot lately. Uh, who else? Well, thank you. The, the, you, you spoon fed me one of those. I'm trying to think. And then I hadn't seen any Forrest Best work until about two weeks ago, in real life anyway. And so then now I want to throw him in the mix if I could. <laughs> those Forrest Best pieces I saw that are kind of traveling around right now and are in LA blew me away. I felt really close to those. Um, I'll probably come back as my brain catches up with itself. Yeah. I'm looking at the motion and the movement in both the water and the land, and I was wondering if you could kind of help us understand why you see so much motion and movement in the land as well as in the sea, because the sea seems in this exhibition less movement and the land seems more? That's a good question. Um, I don't know that I really saw the waves in the sea being less, but they do, now that you say it, they're a little bit almost like they're on pause or something. Um, well, I think my best, um, my best assumption about why this has happened is that since I was making narrative work about this kind of imagined world, and it's gone, and it's really gone now, um, what I kind of saw a lot of this work it, as is snippets of a new world. So I really feel like this is the beginning of a world. And it's important for me to say, I didn't say this before, it was, I didn't say it directly anyway, the work was apocalyptic before, so it was all about this, like, oh, it's all going to go away. And I said that openly. And this is more about a birthing of a whole new world. And so I guess if I'm a, to imagine that in my head, I think that is probably exactly why I, I, you see that movement. You see things coming into focus. And yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the one behind there with the red you know, moon. And so it's a creation almost. Like this is kind of like the very beginning of what I hope could be an environment I investigate for a long time. Hey there. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your experience with Werner Herzog. And if that had any impact with you. Yeah, good question. So if you guys know the filmmaker Werner Herzog, I went to what he had was called a rogue film school. 
and it was just a seminar in a weird hotel in Koreatown in LA. It was when I still lived in Texas and I wasn't going to apply. I just remember getting the information for it and getting really excited for filmmakers that they got to go because you had to apply with a five minute clip of your feature length film, which I didn't have. So, but at the last minute when I could, I know the next day I could f overnight FedEx, a good friend of mine, Ann Reagan, kind of encouraged me and said, you just need to apply. Just whatever you do, if you put a photocopy of your drawing in that thing or something, that would work. So I made, I don't know how to do anything on the computer except email. So I put together, somehow I got the wits in me to like make a PowerPoint presentation of my work and it was terrible. I think I didn't even know how to get rid of the filter and so it had like weird, stupid things going on. But I somehow got accepted and we had, I do think it was four or five days with him and it was not audio taped, not videotaped. So you were just with him sharing his kind of secrets to what he does to make film. We learned things like lock picking so, because, and how to get through a police barricade. Um, because he's also, he's talking about really what it takes to make art. And it is, I mean, those are real life examples, but that's how it feels <laughs> to all of us in a way. But um, how it influenced me is I made the, uh, in a lot of different ways. There was something about his kind of slowness and kind of quiet attitude that encouraged me even more to kind of, I, I really don't know how to describe it. He's kind of almost has a witchy effect on, the, on a room when his, with his presence. So there was something about just being around him that kind of gives you a jolt of just kind of following whatever you want to do without any apology, which I don't know how much I needed that because I'm just kind of that way anyway, but that there was something about his insistence on everything he does being not really right, but being as it should be. And he talked a lot about um, filmmakers can just kind of die off because they can't make a decision. He's real into decision making. Like don't, don't, don't like keep asking yourself questions or th if you don't think it's right, then you shouldn't be doing it. And so it was just kind of a good self-confidence, you know, reminder of how important just kind of action is, if that makes sense. When he says, when you don't think it's right, don't do it, I mean, he literally means that. He really means, like, don't make the film then, or just end it and then move on and make another one. Yeah, because there are all these kids who kept talking about, I've been editing this film for five years, and he's like, oh, you just need to stop, like, just give up and move on. <laughs> and that was helpful to me in a lot of different ways, and in the way I kind of I kind of did similar things to that with my work in the past where things would take almost three years at a certain point. And to live that way is one thing. And maybe I do want to make another piece at some point that will take five years or ten years. But I should also make some other things because you're just getting insane if you do that. Or at least I was. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's your favorite piece? Oh, Christy, that's a good question. I. I really think it's the small red one that's on the postcard for the show, so straight over that way behind my brother over there. <laughs> Tiny little seascape with a red sky because it was the first, um, it was the impetus behind me making, including color. So one day I work with composition notebooks um, all the time and write notes constantly. And there's always been a mechanical pencil in that thing for ever since I was like 18 when I started using this certain kind of notebook. And then suddenly I'm just making images, kind of thinking about what to do now, or I don't even know what I was doing. To be honest, I could have been taking notes from Dawson's Creek at the time or something like that. <laughs> um, but I suddenly had this image where I knew the sky needed to be red, and I have no clue where it came from because I really didn't want to approach color. So I had to run and find an old Prismacolor from undergrad school and make the little note of that piece. And so. That piece wasn't the first one I tried, but I knew that was going to be kind of the central image for what was to become this new kind of world. Well, that's my favorite. What do you say about that? <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bad choice, Christy. No, I love it. That piece is called Heaven, so it's a direct kind of antithesis to how my, what my feelings were about Hell, which was the piece that I talked about that I got that lot that was de de destroyed or sort of destroyed in the hurricane. And this is the counter to that in a way that, I mean, very literally, it looks like heaven to me. And it's also me, it's an image of my environment where I live in the Santa Monica Mountains now. 
and the way that landscape is layered. I've done it in different ways in the past where landscapes, there's many different horizon lines and one might be floating, which is based on pre-Renaissance um, altarpiece paintings that always have all these multiple worlds within one space. But um, this one is a new version that's a little more based in reality, but I use these two papers to get that kind of illuminated quality behind it. And our guy, Trini, who does an amazing job in the, with everything in the gallery, he lit it a very special way so that that, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, I was kidding, I hope you know. I do like that piece, too. <laughs> and it's the only one with just graphite, if you guys, so that's kind of, I'll still do that. I'm not just only doing the oil pastel. So I can't, I can't resist. Okay, the difference between that one and this really serene sea with the, you know, tell me about the difference between the juxtaposition of those two. I don't know that I see them as, di do you see them as very different? I do. You do? Do you know, because I don't as much, but um, just because technically speaking, they're both using two different papers, and this one is much more calm to me. Um, this one is a little more, kind. it's just kind of a crazier image to me, and it's a little more complicated in that if you were stuck in that world, it wouldn't feel kind of as good as this being stuck in this world. So I can say that. Does that make sense? Oh. Um, but this one to me... I mean, this one could almost be called heaven in a different way to me. This, I can't remember what this one's called exactly, but I think it's called mourning. Or I think it is called mourning. Does anyone know? Anyone have a sheet out? And the palm. The, the palm. And the introduction and that theme of the palm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. The palm tree, I'll be honest, I always hated palm trees. Like, really had a deep hatred for palm trees for whatever reason. I thought they were stupid looking. I thought they were goofy. And I, if you know my work, I love trees, and I really drew a lot of trees in my day. But palm trees, no way. And then I've lived in Los Angeles for two and a half years, and I started to see them in a different way. And it's not so much a salute to the palm tree here, but it's more just they're all over the place, and they're way weirder than I thought. They are so bizarre looking. And my experience in the land of palm trees out there is not necessarily an, like I just don't bow down and worship them, but I am just thinking they're so kind of ominous. And at night, when I'm normally out at night, not during the day, so I see these bizarre anthropomorphic kind of monsters in the sky just kind of hanging out above me, and they, they kind of creep me out, in, in, to be honest. And so that one that's the ghosted one is how I see palm trees every night. I walk with my dog and stuff, and I, I, it really... I'm more fascinated with it now, but I still don't love them, if that makes sense. But yeah, that's a palm tree too, so kind of peering through there. Good call, Wade. <laughs> how, am I, how am I doing on time? Are we getting sick of me yet? Yes. One last question. Yeah. So could you talk a little bit about scale? Because it, my impression with these, especially the palms, is they're so powerful. And you, you play with scale a lot. Your work can be very, very large. And, and these are really, really very compact and really effective in their state. Like, what, what goes into the choice of scale? That's a good question. I, um, yeah, I mean, I was really dead set on most of my focus being on my huge pieces. And they took so much time and all of this. There were a lot of weird reasons for me adhering to this principle of I am going to make massive work. And now, I think, again, it has a lot to do with losing work. And it has to do with me thinking about um, kind of being at Rogue Film School with Herzog and just, you know, I only have so much time on this earth. I don't know when I'm going to be gone. And I have more to say than to, I mean, I could count down how many pieces I could make if I kept going with the big ones until, let's say I had until I was 70, and it wouldn't be that many at this point. So there was a little bit of that, but more than anything, my main reason is that I think ev a lot of people tend to think that, if they, uh, that bigger is better. And I do not feel that way at all. And, I am, and particularly, I don't feel that way about art. And I think a lot of artists always think the solution is either to make it fluorescent or make it enormous. <laughs> and I'm sorry, but I'm not, I, not that there's not some pieces that are fluorescent that I like or big that I like, but 
Overall, what draws me in the most has always been unassuming small works, normally black and white and normally etchings. And they're always the things in the museums that are kind of tucked off to the side on the way to the bathrooms or something. And I, I have a deep appreciation for that. And, f and what matters to me is what's going on within the picture frame. And it's almost more alluring to me if you have to walk up and really look at something that's this tiny. So that is something that I'm finally remembering about myself, because that's how I started making drawings. They were all that big. And I have a pretty good feeling I'm going to have a, most of my focus for the rest of my life on smaller works, because it just makes sense to me now. And it feels like the core of me a little bit more. And a lot of the big scale work in the past was a little bit more, um, I was just on a weird, crazy, obsessive train that I have jumped off of. And uh, so these, I have the time and the energy to think about small stuff. Thank, thank you. you. Robin, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.